Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, uh, dear friends and supporters of law as culture, I have to go back on the other side in order to see myself. Otherwise, the joke that I want to make will not be understandable. There will be jokes, not very much, but some at least. The situation is a bit spooky. We are talking about a pandemic, a global phenomenon, under the only communication conditions that are justified. That is, we are avoiding the danger of contagious sociality by using this Zoom format, a format which deprives us of the many positive aspects made possible by the Kate Hamburger Center's approach, namely communication through co-presence as the secret to incredible cognitive opportunities. However, on the other hand, without this new form of communication, we would have never been able to bring together as many deliberative and academic culture as we now can from Moscow to New York, from Rabat to Tokyo, from Paris to etc. We are in temporal, but not physical co-presence, even if we perceive ourselves as mere tiles on an oversized screen, which is not even identical for all of us, but rather seems individual personalized. We cannot look into each other's eyes, but we see ourselves, as was once reported uh, about Auguste Comte, after examining his study after his death, writing, Comte always saw himself. It is under these complex communication conditions that we are talking with each other today. In order to further outline the flow of today's event, I will begin by explaining the origin, meaning, and purpose of the book project for no longer than, let me say, eight minutes. I will then ask contributors from all over the world for their word before moving to an open discussion round for the wider audience. This will position us to address one final question in the end. What kind of questions, demands are there for further research on the epidemic from the perspective of the cultural and social sciences? Ladies and gentlemen, how did this book come about? As a spectateur engagé in the sense of Raymond Aron, one could from the very beginning play through the whole range of cultural and social science topol, the categories of space and time that were reorganized, the body and disembodied communication, the meaning of mediality, vulnerability, fragility, resilience, order, crisis, differentiation, inequality, etc. An endless list of basic categories that were affected. At the same time, however, it became apparent that there was something quite specific at the same time became the focus of our attention the importance of rules in, find, in fighting the pandemic. Even this very morning, on the radio of the West German Broadcasting Corporation, VDR, the first message was, what are the new rules? And on Friday, the minister president will explain the rules in a video, video conference. This banal observation leads to the center of the Kete Hamburger Colleague for Advanced Study, Law as Culture. We are dealing with normative orders in times of globalization. Then the question, the second question arose, how can this impulse to not only behave passively, but to take an active interpretive stance be best implemented? Following an initial Appear on our website, several contributions by former fellows and friends of the Kater Hamburger Colleague were successively published, which made it seem plausible after a short time to make a book out of them. 
From my point of view, the focus is on the genesis of the pandemic culture of validity, which I explained in more detail in the introduction and conclusion of the book. Namely, the conversion of normative architecture to the logic of establishing legitimacy through the reference to medical dictates by way of following the rules. In a certain sense, therefore, the assumption that now, in the name of corona, normative orders are created and applied. And this means not only legal norms, but also etiquette, good corona manners, fashion rules, etc. In this sense, types can be formed according to which a legal system supports the belief in its respective correctness. This allows secular and religious validity cultures to be distinguished and ultimately a pandemic validity culture too, in which there is a tendency to justify in the name of, for example, corona ca catalogs of measures, forms of sanctions, fines. 20,000 fines are known for, for Germany only, 20,000. The thesis goes, although certainly not in the long term, that there is a danger that the state of emergency in which society finds itself will become the ground of validity for normative orders as such. But is the case in Germany the same as in Italy or in Great Britain, China, Japan, Austria, Australia? Or as Masahiro Noguchi has shown for Japan, don't traditions play a role in each instance? as we saw in their reaction to the vulnerability caused by the virus. The vulnerability of people, of institutions, their response didn't cause society to become more fragile, or in other words, more sensitive and susceptible to uh, disruption. In this respect, it was obvious to invite those researchers who specialize in the social, cultural, and legal analysis of norms. And some of them came to us today on the tiles of the Zoom conference. Once again, a warm welcome, and of course, all others who have joined us. From its outset, whether in Wuhan or Ischgl, the epidemic has appeared as a global phenomenon with a global spreading effect. The triggered unease and uncertainty surrounding this new virus, which has by no means being fully researched by the natural sciences has on a global scale and in remarkably similar manner tried to limit infection in the absence of medical treatments and vaccines. That's why hygiene measures have been devised that aim to curb the virus spread. This however can only be achieved with rules of conduct, social distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, and uh, the, the most recent invention is a Beherbergungsverbot, uh, a very special and interesting, fascinating case, because it is completely against an ethic of fraternity, and it is called the, by the encyclica, by the way, Fratelli Tutti, and this is a, a very interesting case for cultural studies. First for self-protection, then for the protection of others in the full breadth that normative orders appear as imperatives for, from corona etiquette to corona morality to legally supported regulations that have enormous consequences for the framework in which we operate as state or private actors, the constitution. And this puts us in the middle of our center's topic, namely how human ex coexistence is made possible, protected, or even endangered by legal orders. The corona crisis as a fact is global. Across the world, we see statistics that are similar, although not the entirely the same. We see the struggle of mandatory mask wearing and the misery of isolation that occurs during lockdown and the freezing of society and social relations, a time when private, and that's why we fear to repeat it a second time, a time when private and public life is placed under high tension. But globality does not mean totality, as one of the pioneers of the globalization discourse, Martin Albo has pointed out in a very nice contribution in this volume. 
a former fellow at our center. Against this background, former fellows, scholars from all over the world, from New York to Paris, London, Delhi, Tunis and Madrid, Minnesota to Turin and Messina, who joined us at the center in the Bonnerbogen for a while, took up this topic as their own on a very short notice and, in my view, offered outstanding contributions to this volume, which represents the 23rd volume in the center's publication series, Law as Culture, printed by the Klostermann Verlag and with full, the full support from the beginning by Vittorio Klostermann, who uh, could have joined us today, and I hope that he will follow us, but as a simple Begrüßungsonkel, he is too uh, precious for us to misuse him in such a kind of function. This book, which begins with medical contributions by Maria Carla Gardebusch, Bonio, does not claim that the cultural and social sciences can replace virological knowledge either. But because compliance with rules and their consequences for our community are so central in the pandemic, the question of the effectiveness of rules and norms becomes so important. And with it, questions of the functioning prerequisites and limits of a pandemic validity culture. So thank you very much for your attention. This was my very short uh, introduction. Uh, it could have been even longer, uh, but I spared it to you in order to have a vibrant discussion with all of you. And if you allow, I would like to start with a question that goes to Maria Kala Gardebusch Bondio who is, as I said, a historian of medical cultures and in the same time, a cultural scientist. And my question is very simple. With the speciality in the background that you have, why did you think that to participate in this undertaking would be useful? And why did you think that your contribution specifically was also needed and you would like to be with us. So to say, uh, though you came only two, three years ago to the University of Bonn, but we started cooperation for a while. Very welcome uh, at this meeting. And uh, what would be your answer to this question? Oh, thank you, Werner, for your question and for having given me the occasion to be here and to talk with you. Um, so I will be short five minutes and try to give you an answer. Uh, like many of my colleagues who work in the medical humanities, um, I was confronted with an exceptional academic clinical situation in March 2020. Um, this led to a sort of intellectual mobilization, mobilization in the discussion of uh, rapidly circulating case reports from the country uh, concerned, in the development of clinical recommendations for triage situations, and also in the design of joint research projects. And it was at that time I was in Sweden, as I am now, and um, the events uh, upset all plans. So together with my colleague uh, from Uppsala, Ilva Söderfeld, who is so kind and is here now, you can see her, um, we quickly decided to let uh, a planned joint work wait and so that we could immediately deal with the sanitary war phenomenon that took us by surprise. And we published a, a contribution about this topic, sanitary war. So at the beginning of April, uh, Werner Gebhardt sent me a concept with a title in the realm of the normative, normative dynamics and normative crisis. And a few days later, the request to write a contribution. 
together with Maria Marlott, um, a physician and philosopher, I was in, in the process of writing an analysis of medical research in this exceptional situation for the Journal of History of Sciences. So we found that it was a great idea to develop our thoughts, which had to be very concisely for the journal, in a more in more detail and more freely in a broader interdisciplinary context. And after all the urgency of the outbreak of infection and the deadly, deadly consequences of COVID-19 have had research ethical and epistemic consequences. And that was what was um, moving us and uh, yes, intriguing us. And in this area where regulatory and every, uh, at every level is crucial, the stage of urgency led, leads to questioning and adopting the normative regime of research. It's a, a, kind, a so, sort of correction of this normative construct takes place now and took place in, in, in all the time since the outbreak was occupying us. So the unleashing of the traditional frames of clinical research is accompanied by ambivalent processes. International cooperation, exchange of data, experience, and uh, ex exchange of experiences and also publication of interim results um, are a sign of a certain pragmatism. Uh, but on the other hand, what we observe, observe is also a high risk of errors, lack of quality, uh, of quality control by eliminating the usual peer control processes we all know when we, uh, when we do research, when science in the making is happening. So um, also over hasty political consultation by influential or very distinguished uh, scientists. All these are phenomena uh, we are observing, we're still observing now, and uh, which are quite ambivalent. So um, we were very grateful to, to have this possibility to explore this phenomena and to publish our, uh, um, our thought in this volume. But so much is what I wanted to do about the reason why we were so motivated to do it and to, to, to give you two points, which maybe could help us later by the discussion, the general discussion and also our look into the, the future. So the first point is what uh, quickly emerged from this initiative by Werner Gebhardt is a kind of hybrid mix, mixture, mixture, mixture of digital, and preprint publication, which does not dispense with the traditional medium of a book in its materiality, but loosens up it. So I see this very productive process as a sign that media complementarity is possible through adaptation, acceleration, and the willingness uh, to compromise. And here it is very important, I think, that a publisher like Klostermann was um, agree or, or did agree with this process because it, it is quite innovative. And the second point, point is that um, the snapshot fixed in the book is changing very, very quickly. So every, everyone knows that if you were to write your contribution now, you would uh, probably update it, revise it, or perhaps even correct it. So for some authors um, who are here now, research projects with a corona focus maybe are now underway. For others, the research continues uh, like independently from corona. So, and this, I think, are two important points we could discuss about. 
later, maybe. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Maria Carla. It is always a pleasure to listen to you, and especially when it is so well founded and so fruitful, as in this uh, contribution concerning not only a personal motivation, but one that has scientific grounds and uh, a certain, maybe uh, even a future. And it made it very plausible that uh, the discussion and the communication between medical sciences and the humanities are really needed and make sense, especially in this process, but also our the reflection about the situation we are in as researchers uh, that do not go under the normal processes of reviewing, etc. And uh, under the condition of a necessity to act immediately and with a certain speed in order to save lives, for example. So this changes a lot uh, uh, the situation in which we are doing science, I think. And thank you very much, uh, very much for, for this contribution. We will come back to that. We continue even more strictly the thematic that was raised by Maria Carla uh, when Greta Olsen would be so nice to uh, be with us with her reflections. And I would like to ask her a very specific question. In your contribution in the book, by the way, for those who haven't seen it, it is really existing, the book, and it is 535 pages. Uh, a real thing, so to say. In your contribution, you raised the problem of uncertainty linked to the question raised by Maria Carla. What is doing, what we do in science if there is a situation of uncertainty? In a way, you stressed the vulnerability, the fragility that comes out of such a situation. Two important concepts in late feminist studies. Why this is the key to an understanding of the crisis, dear Greta, embedded, you are embedded in law and literature studies, American studies from a feminist point of view and others. Uh, why do you think that uncertainty is the key to have access to uh, the situation from the point of view of cultural studies? I appreciate the moment of being here. I wrote about uncertainty in the book and my main issue was as a cultural critic, also dealing with validity cultures and comparing the US American one to the German one, places that I've lived and worked in, uh, not holding out in the uncertainty of the present and not imposing a master narrative on what's going on. That was my main point. But you're asking me now as a feminist, as a queer decolonial feminist to talk about uncertainty, and I'm happy to do so. What the pandemic does is it makes social inequalities that are existing much clearer. Uh, we are, I am assuming, I don't want to assume too much, all of us on this call probably in fairly privileged places, materially, in terms of our health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we will know, and I'm looking at some of the younger women on this call, also some of the younger men, is, so I'm starting with the small and the local and then moving to the global, is that women, uh, younger women, and anyone who's involved in care work has suffered more uh, during this pandemic. What we see amongst young women seeking tenure, and I looked at my own university and younger women whom I work with, is that because uh, daycare and schools were closed, that they were in a position of two kinds of stress, having to care for their children at home to school them, while also needing to produce academic work. What we've learned from the past, and this is uh, how many peer reviewed uh, publications are being turned in for peer review, uh, who's getting tenure and who's not, is that men uh, recovered 
more quickly from the Ebola crisis a few years ago than women, particularly young women at the beginning of their careers. So I'm starting from people like us, um, those who are academics, but let me move that out. Social inequalities are of course larger than women in academia, women trying to seek tenure. If I look at some mainstream publications like Reuters, the UN report or McKinsey, they talk about our going back to a situation like the 1950s in the global north in which uh, whoever is doing the care work, the primary child care work or caring for elders is the person who has given up employment, who is feeling burnt out, who has gone home, who is in a precarious economic situation. These are real social inequalities. So when speaking about the UN general, a lost generation of girls and young women who, for whom advances for women and girls are now going backwards and a return to gender norms of the 1950s. Now I need to ask you to not think simplistically about feminism. It's not men against women, it's about social hierarchies. I call myself a queer decolonial feminist because I am aligned and involved in the LGBTQ movement and because I take seriously claims uh, about decolonizing feminism. It's not about only white women in the global north who are relatively materially privileged by myself. It's about social hierarchy. So during this pandemic, we have seen attacks, let me move to my own home ground, the United States, on, for instance, poorer women. In Texas, there's been a ban on abortions because during the pandemic, because they've been called elective surgeries and hence not necessary. What this is, abortion is a difficult issue for all of us, but it's not simply as one might claim about protecting life. It is about, pro it is about controlling the lives of women who are poor. Because what we know from the past is that women who are materially privileged will continue to have access to birth control and, and to abortion, and those who have less will not. Similarly, in other states, there have been moves uh, to ban transgender people from participating in sports and for getting medical health. In a larger sense, we know in the United States that to be a black woman is always to be at a disadvantage in the workplace. Thinking intersectionally, this is all the more the case during pandemic times in which the claims of needing to do care work fall primarily upon women. Um, in terms of the larger issues that we're talking about, uh, for me, what this pandemic has been about is recognizing affectivity and the law. Uh, for those of us in Germany, we witnessed recent anti-corona restrictions in Berlin, and people there violently protested, holding up signs with the basic rights, according to basic law, the German constitution, saying that their law was being taken away from them by the dictatorship of Corona. For me, this pandemic beyond the issue of intensifying social inequalities is how passionately and effectively people experience the law. Dear Greta, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful uh, contribution. If I see right, we have there uh, two, uh, and certainly more, even more uh, aspects. Uh, it is good to know how one can qualify the position as being not just simply feminist, but really also from the perspective of a decolonized view on these matters. I think this is very important. And also to see the gender question beyond a binary code system uh, that we really have to leave behind us. Um, but that this really comes out in this very situation of the corona crisis as something um, that has to do, so to say, with hyper-modern 
forms of life and we have a backlash into the 50s and we have a lot of other observations that go in the same direction uh, 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 fall back to community structures for example etc so this is very fascinating very interesting and uh, we also uh, should take your command very uh, for serious that uh, the effectivity of the law is brought out by way of the corona uh, crisis in a new way and that the consensus we have felt in the first period of the lockdown for the phase for example really broke down and this is not only because those people are crazy and they are telling myth etc but there is something that really touches the heart of us and the social existence and the sociality of us because we are we have learned that we are simply social beings we can't deny it thank you once again Greta and I would like to welcome personally, because I couldn't do it before, uh, Masahiro Noguchi from uh, Tokyo. He is, he holds the Franz von Siebold Prize uh, uh, for German-Japanese uh, scientific exchange and was decorated last year by the Bundespräsident Steinmeier. Uh, and this was a very impressive ceremony, also the way that you reacted uh, to his laudatio. Now, as a Weberian who might have memorized the fact that Max Weber died of the Spanish flu in 1920, just 100 years ago, how did you come to the point to give traditions in your article? Such a great place in understanding the crisis in uh, Japan. Uh, do we have to culturalize the corona crisis in a way? So this would be my question, uh, dear Masahiro. And guten Tag. <clears throat> I'm speaking from Japan, Tokyo. The question that Diana gave me is, how do you think about Japan's measures against COVID-19 as the Weberian? In my Understanding, Weberian is a researcher who focuses on cultural and religious factors in modern society. Japan can be said to be a modern society, but different from European countries and different from China and Korea. Similar Eisenstadt discussed multiple modernities. His theory of multiple modernity is very attractive in this context. The text of Max Weber's sociology of religion is interesting for considering multiple modernities and Japanese modernity. It is the reason why Japanese researchers have been interested in Max Weber. As you know, Max Weber died of the Spanish flu just 100 years ago. Yeah, this is my book. In this anniversary year, I published a book about him in the Japanese. But you see Weber's picture and the number 100. Yeah, yeah. This is my name up, but. Okay. Okay. In my contribution, I used two keywords, tatemashi, additional building, and jishuku, self-restraint. Tatemashi means additional, be, additional building. The additional building is char characteristic of old Japanese architecture. Yeah, this is a samurai residence. As you can see, this building is not symmetric at all. There is no good point of view here. 
that, that gives a bird eye view of the whole. The whole building is a result of building up. Japan's government has adopted cluster-based approach, not large-scale testing. As soon as an infected person is discovered, the people with whom the person has been in contact with are analyzed. Each infection cluster, a small group, is traced to its origin. Yeah, this is a strategy of paying attention to the part, not the whole, and responding politely. Yeah, this is animation. Um, Hayao Miyazaki, yeah, filmmaker, he said he begins with details. The whole work is the result of these details. Yeah, yeah this is the picture, it's also yeah, additional building. Okay. <clears throat> The second keyword is jishuku, yeah, that is self-restraint. Yeah, jishuku means to voluntarily refrain from actions. Yeah, it is a scrambled intersection that is usually crowded. There is few. Um, in order to prevent the spread of coronavirus, China, for example, has used digital surveillance without national, national identity card and smartphone app. People can't go anywhere and buy nothing. The surveillance can be said to be very effective. Unlike China, Japanese people dislike strict surveillance and strict legal regulation. Generally speaking, the discourse of crisis gives rise to the discourse of crisis or state of exception gives rise to Leviathan, Leviathan in the sense of Thomas Hobbes. It is necessary to pay attention not only to the pandemic, but also the power that is too strong. Self-restraint is a way, a way to avoid both pandemic and authoritarianism. However, this attitude can be said to be just um, conformism. But it is con controversial, but the Japanese way characterized by self restraint or jishuku. That is all. Thank you so much. Dear Masahiro, uh, once again, an extraordinary contribution that we can't uh, listen to uh, uh, neither at the radio nor at tele te television. Uh, there are such a lot of television informations that pretend to uh, go across the borders, et cetera. But, but this is really a, a very deep analysis of um, what Weber, to come back to him, uh, would have called an expression of the Weltverhältnis. Uh, it is not the activist side that is demanded, so to say, in his words. It is not a passive neither, but uh, Jishuku is something that has a specific character in relating to the world. I think it has to do with a very fundamental trait in not the Japan, Japanese character, but in the relation towards the world and world ethics as it is expressed in Japanese civilization uh, to take this expression. So thank you very much. Um, uh, if you agree 
uh, we have to make a certain jump into another region. Uh, I would like to go to Mexico. This is rather far away, though the person who can tell us about the situation in Mexico lives and works in Paris. It is Diana Vilgas. Your contribution opened a perspective on a world that we regard in general as being out of the law because she's a specialist in uh, mafia organization. But your analysis revealed that the mafia is extremely normatively structured. In a way, they are addicted to the uh, rule of omerta, for example. What does it mean for an understanding of the crisis to learn about the strategies of mafiosi to profit from the specific situation we are in from corona crisis, what type of strategies and what can we learn from that? Uh, your wonderful article is part of the book, but perhaps for those who could read it until now and who, who would like to, to, to open their view uh, on the multifaceted uh, face of the crisis, will be very interested to listen to your explanation. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you, Werner, and all the um, uh, Le Culture Center for this invitation and the invitation to participate to the, um, uh, to the book. Uh, yes, um, mafia, um, mafia as legal order is my main subject in research, uh, in social legal research. And for the book, I explore the, um, the, um, the subject about how the mafia and uh, the cartels, the Mexican ones and the Colombian ones, can um, use the corona crisis to improve their power and, all the, um, and to improve the income of these um, organizations. Uh, we can see uh, that these organizations are going to um, use this uh, moment to um, re uh, replace some um, spaces, social spaces, uh, where the state used to be or not used to be. And they increase the power of this organization. The, um, the point uh, that we have to look uh, very carefully is uh, by now in the corona crisis, but also in a, in a, in a long term um, uh, of time, because the mafia um, is going to be like a legal and social actor in the economic and social crisis after the criminal, after the, um, the sanitary and medical crisis. And we think that the most um, important point of view is to use the um, mafia phenomenon like, um, like a social and normative phenomenon who crystallize all the normativities. And in that example, we can see how the state and other uh, normative orders can be related to an illegal order as mafia ones. In that case, we can see like uh, how the mafia collaborate with the state or other orders, how they replace the state or other orders like religion, um, or how they um, um, they uh, they have uh, like a conflict relation with other legal orders, and in this case, like uh, the legal pluralism in mafia ones in this context of um, corona crisis, we can also um, look uh, look really carefully how the actors, the social actors. Uh, react um, um, how social actors can respond to this uh, legal phenomenon and mafia ones. 
uh, because they have they are going to um, to make some decisions to be in the social and to be in the um, in the social context. Um, an example of this, and we can see how the mafia has the power right now, is like um, mafia can replace the state in some cases as uh, given a medical furniture or given food for poor people or people who doesn't have any assistance from the state. In the other case, we are going to see how mafia are going to infiltrate legal uh, business. In that case, we can see more, uh, we can see further in the, after the corona crisis, how uh, mechanisms of corruption and money laundering are going to increase the incomes of the mafia and the presence of the mafia in the legal sphere. And that's why I choose this uh, example to um, demonst uh, demonstrate how the mafia are going to be, are going to remain a legal and a normative, an illegal and a normative actor in the social and economic uh, context right now and after the corona crisis. Thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Diana. Uh, it, uh, we can always learn from the mafia, I think, sociologically, uh, because it is an anti-order that is very strictly normatively ordered in itself, otherwise it could not function. And uh, apparently it reveals certain mechanisms that are bound to sociality. And this would be another expression of what uh, Durkheimians and others always said, deviance is a social phenomenon and has sometimes even a positive function for a social system in order to show the values, etc., etc. So it is bound to sociality. So normally one would think they would lose any kind of possibility for corruption. You must speak to people and not write emails, for example. A lot of things that need personal communication. Otherwise, you can't work as a real mafioso, I would say. And I think but. In the same time, you were able to show that there is something that goes beyond those personal contact lines, etc. And so we can learn about uh, the functioning of the social system as such. And that is why I think the paradigmatic value of such studies is so important and, and going deeply into the center of the normative complex. That is why, by the way, uh, uh, Clemens Albrecht and Nina Detloff that I could not welcome at the beginning because there were so many people around, but I, I will do it uh, now, please. Uh, made the choice that you become a fellow during our next period next uh, year, and um, we are happy that you will be with us in the future. Thank you so much for the contribution. And if you agree, I go to... Uh, next one, uh, it is a kind of experimental uh, travel uh, through the world. Uh, uh, in former times, one needed 80 days for this. Uh, we are doing this in within two hours, a travel around the world. And uh, the next one, I would like to ask for his contribution, her contribution, in this case, his contribution, is Pierre Brunet, who works in the same city as you. Pierre, looking at the crisis from the other side of the Rhine at the, this very moment, you had been at our center for a while, and having been a fellow at this center, what was the crisis like for you, for your theoretical or practical insights in general? And secondly, would you like to strengthen a German-French difference that came out when you crossed uh, the River Rhine? Thank you so much, uh, Werner. I'm, I'm very happy to be there with all of you. In the crisis, uh, I, I, I have uh, I spent all the time in Germany, and I must say that I was very lucky. <laughs> I know that I was much more lucky than my children who were in, in Paris in the lockdown. 
uh, the crisis was uh, a real time for work and reflection, of course, and I was incredibly lucky. I had never been able to work with so much time before. But this time was also very busy with something else. Um, I tried to understand something of the normativity during this period. And it was not that simple, I, I must say. Uh, I never imagined that supposedly well-functioning legal systems could so quickly and easily go wrong. And times were really hectic. Even in Germany, I must say, I'm sorry, but... Uh, we know that before, between all the lenders, uh, the, the policies were very different, and, and it was something which was amazing. Um, has you, has many friends from the uh, the the Rechtsabschulter uh, College? No, uh, I'm working um, on the topic that is not so new. Um, the, the topic is rights of nature. And this topic has undergone profound renewal in recent years, and this crisis has further deepened the, the need for this topic. I was struck by the, the number of occurrences of the expression uh, la nature reprend ses droits in French, and nature takes back its rights. Uh, and so I learned during the crisis that nature has rights. So I, I, I was working on something which was really <laughs> Really real, but what rights and moral rights and legal rights? And do we need to give rights to nature and to all nature? But don't worry, I'm not going to, to give you a long talk about this book. But I would just like to make a brief remark. We, we have now a new friend or a new enemy called Corona, and this new member of our biotic community is forcing us to think about our relationship with the natural world, whether we like it or not. And once this treason has been laid down, everything remains to be down. It's quite widely accepted that our situation is due to the fact that we overexploit the natural world. So can we continue? I don't, I don't think so. Who will speak for the pangolin, for example? Who will speak for the bats? Who will speak for the ecosystems? Will Leviathan has said, uh, ever speak for the pangolins uh, once the corona has disappeared? And we have regained all the human strength to continue our exploitation of the natural world. A very different normativity, I think, must be proposed. A normativity that insists on our responsibility towards the natural world, but also on, on the existence of this natural world with us. My point sounds moral, but I hope it's not moral. I'm not asking us to do the right thing. Uh, though through multiple signs, we are in the process of perceiving the limits of relationship with the world. It was already the case in the 70s, but environmental standards now exist, of course, but they are regularly violated, and they are always thought of from a human point of view. The normative point of view we lack is the non-human point of view. It's up to us to find normative instruments to translate this point of view. It could be the Parliament of Things proposed by Latour. It's one possibility. There are others, and we must reconcile our test for freedom and democracy with the living world. And those who populate this world do not always want us to be there. And that's the real question I have, we are facing. And, and that's all I, the point I, I want to make. I, I, I won't give you the real solution today, but that's the, the issue I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this uh, short and very impressive uh, plea for rethinking our fundamental categories in the light and in the shadow of the corona crisis. And you made it very convincing that we can't turn back uh, to things as usual. and. Uh, we, we we try, we all of us, or well, most of us, work for a point of view that goes beyond just our small symmetry or uh, uh, symmetry or, or small town, etc., and take other perspectives. But sometimes we really need to go there to be in those countries, to live there, in order to be able to do that. So. 
with regard to intersubjectivity with plants, of course, in a way, we should transform ourselves into a kind of plant. And uh, during Carnival, for example, we are trying to do that. And there are some limits to that. This is true. But however, our imagination is sometimes very, very limited. Goethe said, oh, we can analyze nature, but we can't understand it. However, uh, this is also a plea to give more life, inner life, uh, to uh, the life world of nature and to, uh, and in, in, in a certain way it means also to make it more uh, human, though the discussion about the Anthropocene uh, debate, we had it before at our center, and it might also become a new notation, connotation in this context. Uh, excuse me, this was a little bit too long, but I tried to make to our the way to our next uh, speaker, if you allow. Thank you once again, uh, Pierre, and you might answer questions um, uh, later on. Uh, this is Yusra Abu Dhabi. Yusra Abu Dhabi, you are working at Raba. Uh, your work focuses on climate change in the South, namely in Morocco and Africa. Uh, so I would like to ask you a question as follows. Where is the connection to the corona crisis when you work about nature? Pierre Brunet, he has explained, but you may have another answer from your specific perspective in the Maghreb, which developed so clearly in the article that you contributed kindly to our volume. Could you explain and tell us why we should read your article, please? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Werner. Uh, well, hello everyone, and congratulations to Professor to be, for being able to carry out such a monumental project at the same time. Uh, I started my paper without really knowing the scope of the work, and I discovered over the months that it included more and more authors and more and more subjects. And I really think that this book is an important contribution because of the plurality of point of views. Uh, and. Uh, who would have thought, for example, that we would raise relevant issues between a flu and gender norms? And yet it is, like all the other issues raised in this book, uh, an important question. Uh, I have corona myself for almost three weeks, and I was particularly struck by the way my contact at the Ministry of Health, after telling me the result of my test, explained to me how I should cook according to a number of health rules. So I didn't know if I should tell her that my husband is the one who is usually cooking or if I should explain to her how she should avoid spreading this type of behavioral norms. But I really learned from this experience and uh, I could go actually, uh, I'd like to go uh, further now in that depth thinking. So contrary to what this short, uh, what I just said suggests, my research is not about gender, but about environmental normativities. And indeed there is a strong connection uh, but I wanted to tell you this story because the common point between the two is that there are societal behaviors that each normative community try to disseminate, sometimes by trying to impose them or by blame shaming. And the answer uh, to, to Pierre Brunet, who is going to fight for nature right now, it's only the human. So uh, the answer li lies in the fact that we should or we had or we will um, develop new environmental normativities. So consequently, where, when uh, Verna asked me to submit a reflection on the coronavirus, the first question that came to my mind was, given that the health crisis has environmental origins, namely deforestation leading to zoonosis phenomena, um, just in case zoonosis being the diffusion of a virus from animals to human, and given that widespread containment also had a direct effect on the reduction of greenhouse gas emission, are the environmental standards accepted within our society about to change? So could the pandemic have a possible effect on raising awareness on climate change? The coronavirus crisis had had an immediate impact on the environment, but not only on greenhouse gas emission, in the space of one spring season, nature has taken back its rights, and we have been able to observe 
with the naked eye or with the naked ear, the return and uh, a proliferation of several animal species near our homes. And for many, the lockdown collective experience has provided us an opportunity to, to be and exposed for longer period to environmental information, including the zoonotic origin of pandemic viruses, and increase the sense of interdependence between citizens of different backgrounds. And seems, this seems to have increased awareness of transnational links and the butterfly effect. We all have seen videos on, on social medias of other people in the other side of the world doing exactly like us, struggling with the same issue. And this assumption can be partly verified by the increased number of journalistic or academic publication devoted to this uh, topic during the period of confinement. And in a more general context where the subjects of environment had already acquired more legitimacy in the field of not only Western, but also global political ideas. So following this, uh, we, uh, I observed that many countries have taken new steps in combating wildlife trafficking and protection, protecting the forest. And first and foremost, China. So in political sphere and in election, environment is also becoming a major topic. Because of the pandemic, there is this additional argument uh, saying that our lives, our health is directly impacted by the way we care about the environment. We can thus say that the COVID-19 crisis has perhaps more than other previous epidemics uh, or pandemics of zoonotic origin reinforced global environmental awareness. So of course, this transition to more ecological development models still faces many obstacles, lack of information and resistance from polluting actors, uh, especially in the southern countries uh, where the information is less uh, spreading. Nevertheless, the environmental bills and normative changes implied by the crisis are likely to become an important political and electoral issue in several countries. In fact, the COVID crisis accompanies the transition of the field of health studies from a purely hygienic, I think Bernard uh, talked about the hygienic norms uh, in his introduction, to a more environmentalist vision and from a local uh, approach to health to a more global approach to health. So in concrete terms, this would amount to treating the coronavirus by requiring those around them to not only to wash their hands or to wear masks, but also by combating the environmental factors that cause its transmission in a faraway country. And consequently to that, the concept of environmental health or eco-health according to uh, the UN and uh, the uh, health organization is gradually embracing the new emerging country of concept of global health. So to varying degrees and depending on the country, the slow transition towards the greening of legal systems seems to be encouraged by the political effect on the coronavirus, of the coronavirus crisis, suggesting on the one hand that there is indeed a transnational trend and the other hand, a close relation between the evolution of societal norm and the evolution of legal norm. So yes, people are actually trying to defend nature consequently to the coronavirus, which is quite positive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much once again for this concise and precise uh, intervention uh, that played for uh, seeing the positive side effects of the crisis, what at least very often social scientists and cultural studies try to show that there are uh, latent functions of deviance of crisis situations that might even embitter uh, social life and social structures, and this even with regard to the environment. Uh, thank you very much, very much for this uh, very impressive uh, contribution. And we certainly will come back to it, not only during this conference, but I think it's such a fundamental topic that touches and, and, and com uh, is in connection with, uh, um, with Pierre's, uh, uh, Pierre Brunet's uh, view uh, that we simply have to come back to, to that. Uh,
Alexander, Alexander Filipov is meanwhile with us, and uh, as I could not welcome him before, uh, I would propose that he now may speak uh, in five minutes, not more than this. Time is running out in a way, but we have, because we have still, I think, and I would like to propose three people to speak on one side. Peter, I would like to listen to his analysis, and I would also like to understand better what Anne-Marie Bonnet, uh, from the point of view of history of art, uh, uh, has to contribute to our uh, debate. And so Alexander, uh, Alexander Filipov is our, uh, the next person I would like, like to ask a question, if you allow. So let me ask you a very simple question. It is too simple for you in general, for your sophisticated way to think, but I pose it, however, in this way. The state of exception is a main argument in your analysis as a specialist in Karl Schmidt, Max Weber, and the debates uh, of the 20s. Would you like to give this Schmittian concept some, some so to say, uh, Russian colors in order to grasp uh, the situation with regard to Corona uh, now uh, in, in our days? Uh, is there to be made a link between? Uh, is there a specific way to express the situation of emergence and of exception in a Russian way of doing Schmidt? Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gifford. Um, I'm happy to participate. So uh, the question uh, addressed to me was, to put it bluntly, how the things uh, were and how they are going now in Moscow and Russia, as if, uh, and I said, as if Russia were something very special, an exception from the general order of rules. Well, in a sense, it is as every sovereign state is a special case, as it finds or tries to find out its specific ways to fight the pandemic and transforms its social political order. Different states have also something in common in their reactions to corona pandemic. And what I mean is not the compliance with the rules and norms of international law and adherence to the recommendations of the World Health Organization. Just the contrary is the case. What strikes me from the very beginning of the pandemic is first of all the visible, all but not all is honestly admitted, melting down of the international law and the vanishing solidarity of the world community, all the beer of the world order. The globality of the pandemic and the globality of the reactions to the pandemic are growing more and more opportunistically according to situations as they would be understood by the governments and uh, political leaders. The picture on the cover of the book is a variation of the famous picture of Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Well, I will proceed to Carl Schmidt immediately, but this is very important. Uh, this is a um, famous picture of Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, plugged by infection, depicted as viruses placed where the members of the state should stay. Well, I dare to remind you that Hobbes lived in the times of plagues, of those regular European plagues of the 16th and 17th centuries. Once, as the students of the University of Oxford, he had to take long vacations to flee to his family house. Next time, being in the continental Europe, he preferred not to visit Florence because of plague, etc. Well, in a recent interpretation of the famous picture, people discovered even the doctors in the professional suits and with their long nose uh, masks uh, on the streets of the deserted quarantine city. So he experienced the plug, he experienced and he uh, developed his ideas of the sovereign state in the time of plug. This was the idea of Hobbes, that there be no international law and the sovereign states are fighting against each other as if they only they were in the state of nature, as gladiators, he said, on the arena in the ancient Rome. It resembles the current situation. However, only partially, Hobbes tried to demonstrate how the sovereign power would cover out a piece of interhuman relations and institute the order of, guarantee, of guarantees and rules, even in so exceptional time at the time of epidemic. I was asked how the idea of, 
of Carl Schmitt concerning the dictatorship and the state of exception to help us to understand the cause of events in Russia. Well, Carl Schmitt was one of the most influential thinkers of the century who tried to follow Hobbes in his interpretation of order. It is noteworthy that all this point uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, that um, his intentions were the same as those of the classics of sociology. They all tried to find the answer to the question Tolkien Parsons once called the Hobbesian problem of social order. The order can be and must be the order of expectations. We know the rules. We know the rules of applying rules. They have sovereign power to issue new rules if necessary and to guarantee applications of the rules. There are but a few important discussions between meat and interpretation uh, uh, of the normative order. Sociologists prefer the real of routine normativity. They say if the political power must comply with the routine rules, uh, uh, even the political power must comply with the routine rules. Schmidt says the normal situation cannot be an explanation either for exceptions or for itself. The exception is what explains even the normal. Exception is the only possibility to get through the dead routine of old rules to the life itself, to what he, following Hobbes, Spinoza, Rousseau, but first of all, Abbas, yes, called constitutive power. If the things were right according to Schmidt, every state now in the situation of pandemic had a chance not only to undertake exceptional measures, paying no attention to the norms, rules, and restrictions of the international law and international organization, but also, also to rebuild their normative order, to recreate the realm of normativity. What I have seen in Russia, and I, I will not say the same about the other states, but what I have seen in Russia is something other. It is not as if the state of exception were declared, albeit the exceptional measures were declared and applied. For me, the most striking was the amount of power de facto acquired by the measures, by, 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 <clears throat> by the mayor of Moscow. He behaved as Hobbesian sovereign or Schmittian dictator with a couple of difference, of course. And then in a week, he transformed back an influential civil servant who did not follow his own decisions as if they were not so reasonable now. Carl Schmidt drew distinction between norms and measures. Well, the measures in Moscow were of such a kind that they should be called norms. However, they were abolished so quickly as if they were but ad hoc regulations. The main problem for me is the following. There is no authority, no side of power where reason, information, responsibility, police power and legal advisor together with a specialist in medicine could create good, reasonable, concise and convincing description of the problem and the norms that they need to introduce and we need to follow in this situation. So this is, let me conclude, not a option, not a Schmittian state of exception. The word exception loses its meaning if the rules would contradict the laws and each other, if they are not only hard to follow, but also hard to explain. And what I want to stress now, hard to expect, hard to predict on the basis of the common sense. A situation of changing severe, ineffective, and contradictory rules is not new, as the situation of a pandemic is not new to the mankind. However, what we need is the normalization of exception and not the exceptionality of the normative. Thank you. Once again, uh, Sasha, uh, 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 extraordinary uh, remarks and extraordinary uh, contribution uh, going from uh, uh, the Hobbesian analysis of the state of nature in the interpretation by Tolkien Parsons to uh, Schmidt and Weber and an application of the Hobbesian and Schmittian version to what is going on with the very provocative themes in the end that not the exception but the normalization is the problem we would be in. And of course, uh, there is a subjacent uh, 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 intentionality uh, might be behind that we certainly should and must discuss. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for, for this important.
uh, contribution. And uh, as you're very embedded in the uh, international discussions and editor of journals uh, that reach a, a, a huge uh, crowd, um, but sometimes uh, uh, Russia is really forgotten in the debates in Germany. And that Russia that I uh, uh, like and love is the Russia of the intellectuals uh, that are so often forgotten in uh, the look that we throw over uh, there to Moscow and Siberia, et cetera, et cetera, from, uh, the, the, from, from, from Central Europe, so to say, and thank you so much the more for, for this wonderful contribution. I would like, um, as a follow-up in a way, uh, but certainly differently, uh, and it's to P Peter uh, uh, Goodrich, if, if you allow. Uh, uh, Peter, you are uh, famous for your surprising views on the normative legal emblems, the deep unconscious traits and traces of the law you have analyzed. Uh, so let me say it in this way. What really did uh, surprise you? The exceptionality or the normality? Or was, what it, was it like when you were walking your dog at Beverly Hills? So a panjandrum of protractic and proleptic prognostications and predictions of benevolence to all of you. Delighted to be here. And as you can see, I have corona normativities with me all the time. It's by my bedside table. I pick <laughs> it up, I take it to breakfast. It moves to my office. When I go out to the swimming pool, I have it with me. I have it with me when I take walks. I take it out with me so that it can meet the trees, its parents, from whence it came. And my response to corona is in uh, that very notion that is held on the cover, which is basically that those on the bench, the normativities that speak, those in robes are also microbes. And it's that conjunction and the rewilding of how we think of the book, how we think of the normative, how we think of the boundaries between an earth jurisprudence now necessary more than ever and a precedent that is dead, a past that can't help us, a need to reorient, rewild, reconsider and address from the perspective of the future and from the perspective of that across the boundary line between nature and culture, human and environment, that the long fingers, the chiroptera of zoonosis have made us finally more aware of, though maybe not to the extent that we will avoid rapid extinction. So rewilding is the sense of a jurisprudence that takes its motor <coughs> and its engine from the earth, from nature, from the microscopic, atmospheric, erratic, and that which surrounds and imbues us with the microcosms that we each contain. So it, it's in that sense that boundaries seem to me to be the primary product the primary question that corona has thrown our way in normative terms. Boundaries have shifted the need to be the other side of the boundary, the need to understand the complexity of that which is not within the pale but is outside of the pale in old English language. The jurisdiction of all of those others that the boundary has sought to exclude. Now, comes to incorporate the vegetal, the animal, and uh, the atmospherics of nature in its multiplicities of atmospheric and uh, global forms. In other words, the juridical boundaries have fallen away, both temporarily and the precedent no longer works. That's not what will help us in the future. 
and also in spatio-temporal terms. The global boundaries have evaporated, the national boundaries have reformed, and in effect, zoonosis requires proboscation. Zoonosis requires the snipe fig, the pug nozzle, the tiller, the prow, the balance of realizing just for a moment that what comes in through the nose is life itself. Have a good morning. Thank you uh, very much. Um, from a very nice afternoon at the River Rhine and for this very condensed uh, contribution that we uh, have to reread, but at the same time, um, we should discuss certainly uh, later on, uh, as if I got it right, as a paradigmatic situation in which old categories break down, in which a new kind of jurisprudence, a new kind of wild thought uh, might be and uh, allowed because it is simply necessary because uh, things can not continue as uh, you, you were saying, as we are accustomed to. On the other side, the remedies that are hygienic uh, remedies are uh, uh, the, the recommendation to come back to, to the rules, to the norms, just be behave according to the rules, rule according behavior will bring health to the world. That's the message that we read day by day and hour by hour. And even as I mentioned in uh, uh, my uh, small introduction, we listened to that by way of asking by a moderator at uh, the broadcast uh, uh, center uh, uh, in Cologne, uh, what are the new roles, rules for today? And there we come certainly in the old tension between particularistic and uh, universalistic uh, ways uh, 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 of ruling and the question of borders do not halt at the national borders. But I have an example from Hamburg, if I see right, where there are, uh, are rules that go from one street to the other in a different way. This is crazy, rather, rather crazy. In Germany, we have the impression that we go back to the Kleinstaaterei of the 19th century in a certain way, and uh, oh, this uh, reveals a lot of problems behind. But before going too deep into that, once again, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this very deep, deep analysis. Uh, I would like to give as the last word of uh, somebody who contributed to the volume, uh, last uh, but not least uh, to Anne-Marie Bonnet uh, from the point of view of the art historian. When uh, some minutes ago, uh, uh, a good old friend, uh, Sasha Filipov was mentioning uh, the, uh, the cover of the Leviathan, uh, uh, I saw in the same time Grishka Petri at the screen, who has done a wonderful article just about the importance of those uh, pandemic elements in uh, this picturing and imaging. So uh, unfortunately, Sasha uh, did not receive the book so that he did not and he could not read your article, dear Grishka, uh, but uh, he will do it uh, very soon, as I hope, when he will receive the book uh, and will ha ha hold it, uh, hold it in, in his hands. Uh, Anne-Marie, uh, je peux te poser une question, si tu permets. Everything comes full circle when we return to art. I remember that in the beginning you were hesitant to participate at all, but then enthusiastically embraced the project of doing a book under those somehow difficult conditions. So I ask my very, very simple question. What can be learned from the crisis again? And as you have been in touch with many artists and institutions during the last month, what is the role of art besides wild jurisprudence, as we learned some minutes ago, 
in this type of learning process we are in? This is my question, Gerard Marie. I thank you so much uh, for the invitation. And um, well, uh, while listening to all of you, I could have always said, um, have an artistic position, giving you answers, especially um, about the relation between human and nature and animals. I think of the documenta of Katerine Bargakiev, Katerine Bargakiev, when she said, uh, strawberries are talking, tomatoes are talking, everybody's laughing about. I think of boys and everything. Each question you have been turning to, I could uh, bring you some artistic position spoken about that. Yes, why was I, I was so terribly shocked by uh, when COVID came up. Uh, because I thought um, now is the time in my life I will be very free to move around and never have I been more stuck to one place uh, in my life before. And um, we don't, maybe not remember, but we, I was very frightened because I'm a very fragile person, people around me and so on and so on. And um, so what is art? No? What, what, uh, I asked a lot of questions around me um, and Shockingly, most artists at the beginning were not unhappy because art is something individualistic, uh, egoistic, monomaniac, and most of them are, were very happy to have more time. Like uh, Pierre Brunet said, never had that much more time. So at the first moment, uh, it did not make much because they were even more concentrated than before. But what is art? Art is communication, immediacy, exchange, sensuality, sensibility. All that was not possible anymore. Um, so, so art for, for us is something essential, but in the social situation in which we were, we just were remember that art is a luxury. It's not system relevant. Uh, art is something you just can't afford. And I noticed it, but what did work very quickly on the very moment, the market. I got every day 20, 30 mails from galleries, auction houses, who very quickly went on. So what worked is the market, the money, but not the real presence, the real possibility to see something. And I learned that, like Maria Grana said at the beginning, there is no possible independence from Corona. And as when I, you know, in the, when I was at the, at the um, colleague, I was speaking about autonomy of art and never ever was the non-autonomy of art more present than in the moment. Art is very dependent on the structures of distribution communication. So the social places for art, the social one, which are the museums, um, should be a place now of safe encounter. Even I just, when I want to make a seminar now, I will go to the museum because there's a place which is empty. Museum have always been empty. They should now turn into the place where there's a possibility of cultivation for everybody. Their uh, hygiene is there, security is there. Um, they should open. <laughs> Not a problem of super crowding in museums. I'll go to the museum usually. So it's a, it would be a chance for them to turn to it. Um, that museum are special, specific spaces where everybody can meet. And they should use this. Uh, moment and to remember that art is for everybody. So the, the question of art um, is how we say cultural, cultural politic. It's a cultural political question. And beside giving money, uh, which has been happening in, um, in Germany, that it should be really um, basic re-education on the way the role art plays in culture, in really uh, education in every dimension. So. This pandemic is a litmus test for our egoistic, not very culturally engaged situation. And we should use the situation of rethinking the cultural normativity, the role of things, the role of art, basically. Um, art and culture are a medium to rethink, remodel, reconsider, Reimagine, reperform our way to communicate, to use art, to control art. Not only about the money, but about the basic moment of immediacy communication, which is a problem. Art needs immediacy, art needs communication, sensitivity, and we are deprived of it. 
I just I was just reading a, a text uh, about um, when we wear the masks, uh, how much we are rely on eyes. And in German, we have the augenscheinlich and angesicht. So, so I think a lot about uh, what it makes uh, with us and what the mask make uh, with us. Um, so I think what we learned, what I learned especially, that um, it is a real situation where we have to rethink uh, art as a medium to rethink the cultural normativities, the way we, we deal with humans, with nature, and not as a luxury, but as a basic immediate mood. Thank you, that was it for today. Merci beaucoup, Anne-Marie. In a way, uh, to resume, I would say, it leads us back to the what was co called in the, the 18th century, la condition humaine, in a way, to those basics and, uh, this might be one one wants to to listen to the lesson yes. that has been told. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so we the circle uh, may have come to an end. We started in Bonn. We went all over the world and came back to Bonn, Uppsala, uh, um, and come back to Bonn, uh, Paris, Marseille. Uh, Munich, etc. Uh, most of us are global uh, actors in science, and we touched upon a lot of topics meanwhile. Uh, and I would like to open now the third uh, round of our meeting. Who wants to ask a question to or make a contribution from his or her side? to our debate. So I have a question, and it is something between a question and a comment to the uh, to the speech of Professor Olson, and it is the following. So, of course, as you as you say, I, I'm also working on, on on gender diversity in the law, and I noticed myself that indeed uh, the pandemic and especially the reaction to the pandemic has been particularly detrimental on sexual and gender minorities, essentially because all reactions to the pandemic were structured around the idea that the space inside the house is a safe space and the space outside the house is a dangerous space and while in fact we know that for queer and, and, and women or uh, queer people and women can be can be the other way around but uh, so of course this has brought to the fore a lot of um, a lot of uh, fragilities and contradictions already existing in the system but i was wondering whether in your perception uh, this um, this particular situation has brought to awakenings or you know changes in the politics of, of gender minorities. And I'm asking this question because I noticed it myself and I, I wrote a small, very short contribution for, for a generalist paper in Italy. And it was about the fact that for the, perhaps the first time, at least in Italy, queer people, including trans women, uh, sex workers, Etc. were mobilizing in asking for a new forms of rights. So rights that were beyond uh, simple re cultural recognition towards forms of, you know, state welfare and other kinds of, you know, more complex state intervention. So I was wondering whether, in your opinion, uh, the pandemic and the lockdown might have triggered a reaction in the advocacy for LGBTI and women, LGBTI people and women for you know, for a transformation of, of queer advocacy. So, you know, out of the tragedy, something good, so to say. Thank you. Uh, Stefano, thank you. I actually think that your question goes in the direction of Judith Hans, and it's really wonderful to have you speak. And I'd like to hence be as short as possible, also so that Judith gets a chance to speak. Um, we see contrarieties going on. We see both pushes to more authoritarianism, how this pandemic is being used in the United States, uh, elsewhere to impose new forms of regendering, rebinarism, and a real lockdown and policing of heteronormativity and uh, violence towards queers. And on the other hand, and this goes to Judith's question, and Judith, I'd really like to let you speak, so I'm gonna turn over to you in a moment. Um, 
there is on the ground also because forms of sociality have changed, often an absence of authority right now, uh, traditional authorities, and that allows new communities also digitally to find new forms of activism and to find each other. And so I'm, I really appreciate your specificity about the situation in Italy on this. That it is, we see this as going in both directions and I think we have to be very specific about where and how the pandemic is being used to question traditional norms and normativities and to push against it. And if I may, Vanna, beloved yeah. Vanna, may I turn yeah. over to Judith because I believe her question was very rich and I believe, Judith, I had a chance to look at your work, uh, that you uh, have more to say about this. Yes, please, Judith, it would uh, be nice to listen to your uh, contribution, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I don't want to take up your time to talk about, but it really came to my mind when I listened to your um, observations, and I fully agree that what we experience on the one hand is, is like a shift a back, a rollback, like to, with respect to generals, for example. And on the other side, when I watch what's happening in the Catholic Church in the moment, things are happening that we could not have imagined like a year ago, because people really take this as an opportunity, so to say, to um, it's, it's an empowerment for the laity, it's empowerment for women too. So what we see, and, and I'm wondering, I'm just wondering, and that's a question basically for all of you, if Corona somehow has has become, a, has or is a trigger or a booster for normative shifts, Mm -hmm. one way or the other so we have this both directions um and in the church well we don't know what will come up what will come out in the end uh, of course but what i do see and witness is that basically discussions we could not have had like a year ago and now on the on the table uh, women taking over the liturgies like um, organizing a worship um, presiding over um, forms of prayer and worship that was always male dominated clerical clergy um, business and that's that all shifted and the bishops are kind of happy about it and they, they would have opposed it like very much like a year ago and they don't do that now because that's the only chance they have so it's it's very interesting for me and i'm, I'm not sure what will happen when corona is over maybe it's, we had that with the war like like the women in the war were strong and then the war was over and everybody was returning back to the kitchen but it's a bit simple i put that a bit simple but that could happen as well so we're in the middle of something and something is going on i'm just wondering if you see like also that this perspective and dynamic that that roles could shift in the opposite direction could be an interesting thing connected with mm -hmm. corona too maybe i'm too optimistic yeah <laughs> uh, uh judith and stefano uh first may i ask you to get together and run with that uh corona as uh, a changing of normativities a destabilization mm -hmm. of um dominant form of the normative mm -hmm. and uh you did specifically to what you're saying, there is for me a generous view of Catholicism, which is deeply pluralistic, queer, and wonderfully diverse. And we see then the day-to-day -day institutionalism of the Catholic Church. And in Europe, uh, one is importing priests from elsewhere in order to hold on to uh, a patriarchal system of power, but on the ground, the people that are doing the liturgy, that are doing the care work, the love. I see that you did something on digital Eucharist. Uh, those are not ordained priests and uh, they are not cis men. And uh, I find that really fascinating and rich. I think this is really a very um, interesting um, a de debate in, in, in several uh, respects. I, I would share the impression of an ambivalence uh, with regard to religiously impregnated moralities, for example. On the one side, one can get the impression that there is a new asceticism uh, insofar as drinking is no longer allowed, uh, touching and uh, uh, to, to, to be close to people, a certain kind of 
sociality, Geselligkeit, but in the end, to be clear about that, this has consequences for the choice of uh, uh, sexual partners also, and for the market in that field, if I see right and understand that uh, sexuality has to do with physical presence also, not only, but also on the one side. And on the other side, there are people who are talking about a new spirituality because the question of eternal life has come back. And so some days ago, I was asked to give a talk at the Steiler Missionare uh, for, for them to talk about the sacred, uh, on the traces of the sacred lost uh, did Corona crisis bring a new kind of relig religious uh, Sinnstiftung to the world? So I think this is also interesting, and this would be a general trait of any kind of catastrophe of crisis, that the questions of the meaning of our life comes back in a new way. And this might also be an element of the dynamics of uh, uh, new uh, normativities that uh, are brought to birth in uh, our days. Excuse me for my much too long commentary on the wonderful discussion. Who wants to intervene next, please? If, for example, Martin Rammstedt still would like to comment on normative pluralism as the specialist in legal pluralism in times of uh, corona. You're running a new uh, type of research group at Onyati, and I don't know whether we, you would like uh, uh, to, uh, to make a contribution in this direction, dear Martin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this comes as a surprise. But uh, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by uh, the new individualist normativities that emerge, how, one, uh, how people try to dodge uh, um, um, corona regulations, still like to travel like myself. Um, that would be very interesting. And, um, uh, but of course, we should, should perhaps group and see how, whether we can cluster different different uh, uh, categories of um, uh, normativities that want to emerge now. I think that uh, having a more in, uh, inquisitive perspective, um, it would be nice to, to see what we could find on the ground. I also think that one, has, one uh, does not only uh, develop a, a new sociality, but also a new relationship perhaps with oneself because the normal ways of interaction are so co constricted. And uh, did somebody tell, was it in this call or, or just recently I heard, I, uh, I imagine you speaking, you the other, you are not, who are not, who is not there. So what do I imagine? How do I imagine the other while I'm here in, uh, in front of the monitor? Um, yeah, I think, it was a productive discussion. It really, I, was, I, I keep uh, latching on to different strands of it. Um, it is fascinating to see. Yeah, I mean, it was already there out in the open how uh, how the, the new free spaces that uh, where certain kind of fear reigns. How this is uh, how these spaces are now being clandest clandestinely. Uh, uh, um, penetrated by groups who, who uh, would have otherwise to remain in the invisible. So I think there's much food for thought and I hand over to you because I really think that you want, you want to continue the project and I, I, I see that as much opportunity for us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, dear Martin, from, for this spontaneous uh, uh, reaction and uh, important contribution insofar as the uh, uh, relationship with oneself uh, uh, has a, a very fundamental uh, uh, fundamental uh, item 
uh, in the relationship we have with the world uh, has also been uh, uh, changed, uh, perhaps asked, and I do completely share with you uh, the very specific and um, strange view that we have all the time to see ourselves during those Zoom conferences on ourselves, as I, uh, I mentioned in the introduction, uh, in a way that crazy Auguste Comte uh, 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 did when he was writing, when he was writing, he always saw uh, himself. And we can't look into the eyes of the other, and there is something really lacking. And please imagine and think of it over. Did you really find so many new contacts by way of Zoom meetings? Everything that works is just on the basis of good relations with a lot of trust and personal physical experience behind of co-presence. That's the principle of the Center uh, for Advanced Studies. And this is really lacking at the moment. We try to substitute, but as all substitutes, it's not the real thing. And we prefer it, of course, but we have to fight for that, not in a way, at least to my mind, uh, just to deviate from uh, the rules, but to have a better understanding of the rules and also to ask where the de democratic um, legitimation uh, uh, of this new type of uh, uh, normativities really uh, are grounded in, etc. So a new point um, that I think should also be investigated is the question of sanction cultures. I was mentioning that 20,000 fines had been outspoken in Germany during the corona crisis. That is a lot. The changes in between 50, 75, 125, etc. within Germany, but also with regard to other countries, raises the question whether the imagination, the image of how to bring people to uh, compliance are rather different and what in the end works has been studied in the classical field of the sociology of law for centuries mm -hmm. nearly. And uh, I, th I have the impression that uh, it is not very well understood that uh, delivering an image of a complete anomic situation as Emil Durkheim called it. I'm sitting here at the Kette Hamburger Kolleg in the Durkheim Salon, and I can't uh, really uh, uh, bring an end to this wonderful discussion without mentioning uh, his influence on the understanding of the realm of normativity, where at least it is not bearable that contradictory norms are evolving without uh, any uh, limitation. And we have really to, I think, also from the point of view of the science of norms, to bring more, at least a little bit more clarity into that field. Once again, we I don't feel that we are in competition with uh, virologists and with others, but the role, the importance of the role in the crisis has become very clear. And that is why I think there is a necessity to raise our voices insofar as we think that we are in a way specialists in that field and that we may contribute to a better understanding.